Hey, good afternoon. Um, I'll just jump into it. Thank you to the Ford Foundation for having me. Thank you, Teresita, wherever you are, for having all of us here. This is really wonderful. Um, oh, other way. Okay. So one of the questions that we talked about um, with Teresita and, and coming to this is exactly what is an Afro-Latino? Um, and, you know, I think I kind of represent maybe a, a sort of an atypical idea of that, for especially for New York. Um, so for me, when I think about being Afro-Latino, believe it or not, I think about New Jersey. And I'm going to talk to you. Uh, so I'm going to, I don't have my work up, New Jersey. There you go, there you go. Um, <laughs> one person. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna talk about my work, uh, but there's a bio behind in the, in the program and you can see it uh, online. So I was born in Florida, but at age two I was raised, uh, from the age of two I was raised in South Jersey in Cumberland County uh, between the towns of Bridgeton and Vineland in small rural areas such as uh, Gouldtown, Rosahane, Norma, Rotmanville. Um, so there's a book documenting this area called Small Towns, Black Lives, African American Communities in Southern New Jersey. And it was uh, a photo uh, journal by Wendell White and uh, Deb Willis, who a lot, a lot of us are familiar with, uh, wrote an essays in this uh, book as well. Um, and so they mentioned there that the black settlements there date back to the 19th century. Um, just to give you sort of an, a backdrop. And so these are my grandparents. And uh, uh, my mother's, uh, well, the, um, my mother's parents here are on the uh, left-hand side, and my father's parents here are on the right-hand side. Uh, can you tell who's black and who's Puerto Rican? <laughs> um, so uh, my mother's father arrived from uh, Swainsboro, uh, Georgia, 1945, to this area in New Jersey at about 16 years old. Uh, and eventually he married a local girl here, my grandmother. Her family were farm workers, uh, while my grandfather's family were ministers and farm workers as well. Uh, the area f was very familiar to him coming from the South. And he eventually got work at the Lobiano Trucking Company, uh, where he worked nearly his entire life. And my grandmother was a domestic. Uh, and she eventually, uh, uh, finished her working career at Caesars Palace in Atlantic City doing housekeeping. Uh, my father's parents migrated from Puerto Rico to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1952 and 1955. Um, and they eventually moved to New Jersey, the same area of New Jersey, um, about seven years later. Uh, they were, and they were part of this uh, sort of large uh, spike of migration from the island to the mainland. U.S. after World War II, uh, and a lot of that had to do with uh, Puerto Rico changing over from uh, a monoculture plantation economy to a manufacturing uh, economy, and people were looking for work, uh, particularly people within the um, um, agricultural f farm workers. Um, so he, he eventually found himself uh, in this area, too. Um, my grandfather supervised farm workers, my grandmother cooked their meals, and they eventually got work at processing factories uh, for their, their remaining working years, B&B &B poultry and violin kosher poultry. And these are uh, maps of New Jersey, um, population maps. Uh, one is Latino, one African American. And down at, I wish I had a little pointer, but I don't. Down at the bottom here, uh, this sort of large area um, I'll here. <laughs> so that's Cumberland County, New Jersey. Um, and you can kind of see the percentages are very similar here, you know, in and around 20% population density of, of, of African Americans or black and Latino. And so what you have is a lot of overlap in there where people identify as both. Um, and so, you know, in, in Cumberland County, you have names like Ebony Torres and Pablo Jenkins. Um, and you go to, you know, <laughs> you, you go to a cookout, there's fried chicken and rice and beans. Like people, you ask people where they're from, they say, I'm from here. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> so it's, um, 
very different in New York. You know, it's a very different field in New York where we have sort of these sort of regime re- regimes of uh, of identity. Um, and so, you know, uh, personally, my parents didn't stay together. My father did not teach me Spanish, um, and my family loved me just the same. Um, I'm trying to move quickly. Uh, so this is a slave route map, you know. And my grandparents both have ancestors who were bought uh, to the Americas via the transatlantic slave trade. Both were attracted to these area in New Jersey because it had a strong agricultural industry and white people, as they would say, were not too bad. Uh, and these span and these towns, Spanglish and English are local tongue, cultural idioms are blended, and speaking Spanish is not a prerequisite to authenticity. And uh, just to underscore, you know, I, I, thought, I thought about how do you talk about this? And I, and I realized that this wonderful clip from uh, the activism poet Felipe Luciano sort of encapsulates that. Uh, this is a clip I'm going to show you. I don't know if I have to talk to somebody to do that, but it is a poem that he's reading in the 90s on deaf poetry, but it's a poem he wrote at about somewhere between 1968 and 1970, just to give you an idea of that we we're still here talking about these kind of fault lines. Uh, New York, Deaf Poetry, please give it up for Mr. Felipe Luciano. There's a move afoot to divide us. It's being done by Afro-Saxons and coconuts people who would have us believe that there's a separate gulf between two nations, black and Latino. This is not the poem, (laughs) y'all. I'm telling you there's no difference between Buford, South Carolina and Ponce, Puerto Rico. You hear me? Too many of us grew up in the projects and did bids in the joint together to have anyone divide us on the basis of language. Mambo is black. Merengue is black, R&B is black, Joropo is black, Flamenco is black, Guaguanco is black, Bomba is black. Be careful. They will come to you and say, be careful with those hordes of Spanish people. Fuck them. Jibaro. Mi negro lindo. De los bosques de caña. Caciques de luz, tiempo es una cosa cómica. Jíbaro, my pretty nigga. Father of my yearning for the soil, the land, the earth of my people. Father of the sweet smells of fruit in my mother's womb, the earth brown of my skin, the thoughts of freedom that butterfly through my insides. Jíbaro, my pretty nigga. Sweating bullets of blood and bed bugs swaying slowly to a softly strummed five string guitar, remembering ancient empires of sun gods and black spirits and things that were once so simple. How times have changed, men. How men have changed time. Unnatural, screams the wind. Unnatural. Hebaro, my pretty nigga man. Fish smells and cane smells and fish smells and cane smells and tobacco and oppression makes even God smell foul. As foul as the bowels of the ship that vomited you up on the harbor of a cold metal city to die. No sun, no sand, no palm trees. And you clung to the slimy rib of an animal called the marine tiger in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hibaro, did you know you my nigga? I love the curve of your brow, the slant of your baby's eyes, the calves of your woman dancing. I dig you, you can't hide. I ride with you on subways. I touch shoulders with you and dance. I make crazy love to your daughter. Yeah! You my cold nigga, man. And I love you because you mine. Can we cut, can we cut and here? I'll going over a little bit okay uh arthur schomburg uh so this is arthur Sh- Ar- Ar- arturo 
Alfonso Schomburg, author, also known as Arthur. He was a Puerto Rican writer, historian, and activist that researched Afro-Latino American and African American contributions to society between 19th century and the 20th centuries. His collection started the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and it is a truly transcultural institution. Um, as we look at Schomburg, this is what I want to sort of leave you with comments uh, and questions or statements of some sort. Uh, one, race is an imaginary construct used historically for the purposes of division and oppression. Two, the culture that develops around one's race is real. Three, Artists and institutions exist within a competitive system that rewards the brightest among us. It can be a powerful and positive thing. However, merit is when merit is siloed within race categories, it can problematically reinforce such artificial divisions, even as it tries to help underrepresented communities. We should continue to seek better models. Many institutions structured on racial categorizations were founded in the spirit of activism and progressive change. They could lead the way by breaching divides within communities of color, the communities, period, with dynamic transcultural programming, exhibitions, and discourse, instead of living in fear of betraying the cultural idioms for which they were founded, they could push their boards to steward culture with hope and present an even more representative image of who we are as people. It seems from what I'm seeing, the progressive trend is towards reforming these large institutions, right? Uh, to bring in people of color. If that is resoundingly successful, um, institutions serving communities of color will compete for relevancy amongst ones with great greater funding bases. Um, artists of color and institutions serving those communities need to work together. Their trustees need to work together. Their curators need to work together. Their education and programming departments need to work together. Thank you.